Hey, come on, are you thankful for smart people? People that went to a lot of school are well-educated. I'm so excited to kick off this Big Words series, and you can open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, and as you do, I just want to say another welcome to everybody that's joining us online and any of our campuses. Church, come on, can we welcome everybody that's joining us online, all of our campuses. We're so glad that you're with us. You're in the right place at the right time, and as we get ready to jump into this series, my first thought was, uh, what in the world else am I supposed to say after hearing that? But we're going to dig just a little bit deeper for a few moments uh, into this big word of immutability, and big words in the Bible are important not because it's good for us to get like this head knowledge and feel smarter, but these big words are tied to key doctrines of our faith, and it's important to have sound, right doctrine as we are following Jesus. So we're going to dig into this. Hebrews chapter 6 is where we're going to start. It says this, starting in verse 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. We're talking about immutability, the unchangeableness of God. I am a creature of habit, and at the exact same time and with the same amount of energy, I love change. I love changing things up. I, I, I just get bored with things, and I want to change it, and I think I might have passed that down to my children, or we are all born with a propensity and a desire for things to change. I think about my kids. We don't often let them choose where we're going to go to dinner uh, because then we'd be at McDonald's every single time we eat. Uh, But one time we let our kids choose, and they chose Texas Roadhouse. I said, praise the Lord. We're going to get a steak. It's going to be a good night. Got there, and uh, immediately they ordered their food, And shortly after that, the food showed up. And right as they saw their food, their mind changed. Don't you love that as a parent? They don't want to be at Texas Roadhouse. They don't want steak bites. They want to go to McDonald's and get chicken nuggets. And and thankfully, I'm a parent and my wife is a parent that says, it's too bad, bucko. We're here now and you're going to eat it or you're going to be hungry. And I'm thankful that God is not like us that he will change his mind and his feelings about things like the second hand on a clock, but he is unchanging, unable to change. He is immutable. And I, I love what, it said, what Herman uh, Bavink, a, de- a Dutch theologian, says. He says, the doctrine of God's immutability is the highest significance for religion. The contrast between the be- being and becoming marks the difference between the creator and the creature. Every creature is continually becoming. It is, the, it is changeable, constantly striving, seeks rest and satisfaction, and finds rest in God, in him alone, for only his pure being and not becoming. Hence, in Scripture, God is often called the rock. And ever since the ancient Greeks, they were trying to figure out how does change work. And, and many philosophers and intellectuals determined that uh, in, in, in this world of change, there has to be at the center of the universe something that is unchangeable. Aristotle called it the unmoved mover, a fundamental unchanging entity that initiates all motion and change in the universe without itself being moved. This is the immutability of God, that change is happening, but he is unchanged. Theologian uh, Sam Storms has a list of 10 things to consider about the immutability of God. I'm not going to read all 10 of them, but here's a few of them. To say that God is immutable means that his character is eternally consistent. His character is eternally consistent. It's not like one day 
God decided, okay, I'm done changing. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm going to be immutable. No, for, for all of eternity, his character has been the same. He's not like us that we change the moment we have our first sip of coffee and decide now it's going to be a good day. He, for all eternity, his character is consistent. Immutability doesn't change potential development in a relationship with God. Because God is unchangeable, it might cause us to think how in the world does a relationship develop. But God is unchangeable and he has no need to change. It is us who need to change and grow in our understanding, grow in our relationship and our knowledge of who God is. And immutability does not equal immobility. Immutability does not equal immobility. Meaning that God is unchangeable, but that doesn't mean that God is not active. God is very much active, moving, operating on your behalf, making things happen, doing the impossible, yet he remains unchanged. Immutability matters. This word matters. Why does this matter? Why does it matter that God is immutable? Why does it matter that God is unchanging? It matters because if if God could change, we wouldn't know what God we were going to get that day. It would completely nullify scriptures like Romans 8, 28, that he works all things for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. We wouldn't know what side of God we were going to get. We, we wouldn't be sure of the, the plans and the purposes of God in our life. Are they going to be good plans? Are they going to be good purposes? Does God have something good for me today? Uh, but we can be sure that we have good things, that there are good purposes, there are good plans, there are good promises, because God is unchanging. God is unchanging. It says this in Psalm 102, verse 25. It says, of old, you laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. So we're going to look at a few characteristics of the immutability of God. We're going to look at a few characteristics. And the first one this is, is this, that it's the unchangeable person of God. The unchangeable person of God. We're going to spend a little more time on this one. It says this in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and sin. Another word, as you saw in the video, another word for the immutability of God is the faithfulness of God. God is a faithful God. That's why we sing songs like, Great is thy faithfulness. Whether God is, whether we are faithful to God or not, God remains faithful. He's not like us. He is faithful. Psalm 119 90 says, Your faithfulness endures to all generations. Great is thy faithfulness. It should change the way we sing songs and think about the faithfulness of God. And I think somebody needs to be encouraged that God's faithfulness to you is not dependent on your faithfulness to him. And you may have made some mistakes and you may have chosen to live your life a certain way. And recently you've made a decision to start following Jesus and making him your Lord and Savior. And you could be haunted by your past thinking, how could God be faithful to me when I've lived for so long for myself? But great is thy faithfulness that he's going to remain faithful to you. We serve a faithful God. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says, for I the Lord do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. You're not consumed. So much of our life can feel all consuming, overwhelming. And we feel like it's, it's taking over and there's no hope. But God says that he is faithful. And when we put our trust in his faithfulness, we will not be consumed. 
It's kind of, it makes me think about uh, growing up and if things started to get crazy or, or, or things started to seem wild. Or I remember one time we were on a road trip as a family and we hit a bear in North Carolina. I didn't even know there were bears in North Carolina. But I remember the first thing I did, my dad was driving, the first thing I did was looked at dad. And if dad's not freaking out, I'm not freaking out. (laughs) Hey, come on, can we be thankful that God's not freaking out when life seems to be consuming us? When things seem to be overwhelming, we can look at our father and our life will not consume us. He says we will not be consumed. Another characteristic of the person of God is the word of God. We cannot separate the word from the person. And that should bring some encouragement to us because we're not just trying to figure out a a character in the heavens, but we are able to see who he is in accordance to his word. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. It's breathed out by God. I heard one preacher years ago say, if God said it, that settles it. I want to live my life that way. That I see what's happening in the world around me. I see what's happening in my current situation. But I see God's word. Words from an immutable, unchanging God. And if God says it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay. If God says that healing's available, I believe that healing is available. I'm gonna take him at his word. If God said it, that settles it. I wanna live my life that way. Not because it's just a good book or a religious text, but because it's the words of an immutable, unchanging God. God. Now, there, there are things that get called into question as we read Scripture uh, because there are, there are a few moments where it might seem as though God is changing his mind or God changes the way he feels about something. And I want to address those real quick that, that we can read those and still be sure that God is unchanging. Thinking specifically um, about 1 Samuel chapter 15, when, when God chooses Saul and he says he regrets choosing Saul. Or, or in Genesis chapter 6, where it says he regrets, he regrets making man. And it's, it's, it's something that we as finite human beings try to put words to an infinite God's reaction. And, and what he's doing is not changing his ways, but he is responding to the sinfulness of man. And it's not just when he's responding to the sinfulness in man. He also responds to the obedience of man. You look at at Jonah. He says, I'm going to send you. You're going to go preach to them, and I'm going to destroy that city. So what does Jonah do? We're not going to get into the whole fish part. But he goes eventually, and, and he preaches, and they repent. And God doesn't bring judgment and destroy the city. To the point where Jonah is all frustrated by it. God is responding in our obedience. God will respond to it. Why does it matter that we are obedient? Why does it matter that we live our life governed by the word of God? Why does it matter that we believe these things? It matters because God responds to our obedience. And so God isn't changing his mind. God is responding He's responding to us, which should encourage us that prayer works. When you think about Hezekiah and Moses, God said he was going to bring judgment, but then they began to pray and repentance happened. And in their prayer and repentance, God God didn't bring judgment. That your prayers work. God hears your prayers and he responds to and answers your prayers. He's the unmoved mover. He's the unmoved mover. So that's the, 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 the unchangeable person. The second one is the unchangeable purpose. Unchangeable purpose. James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. There is no shadow in turning with thee. He has good purposes, good gifts, and good plans 
for our life. And the good plans and the good purposes that he has for us uh, are forever. That he, he has things that are for you forever. And we can bank on them, not because we like those plans, but because he is unchanging. Psalm 33, 11 says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. They stand forever. His plans are good. His plans for you are good. They're, they're to prosper you, not to harm you. They're to give you a hope and a future. He has, he has a life more abundantly for you. His desire is that none should perish and that all should come to repentance. This is the purpose of God. And, and the unchangeable purposes of God are unchangeable and they are forever. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves that it's not God's purposes that are in question, but it's our patience at times that's in question. I think about my daughter, she's nine, and she uh, is, is gonna be 19 tomorrow, if you were to ask her. She has so many dreams, and I have things that I believe are gonna be great for her. She wants to drive. And I purpose for her to drive. Just not right now. That would be catastrophic. And I believe that the purposes of God, yes, they are unchanging, but they might be yes, but not yet. That the purposes of God coming to pass in your life that seem like they are delaying may be delayed so it's not catastrophic for your life. Maybe we should trust God at his timing and believe that his unchanging wisdom is the best thing for our lives. He has good purposes for you, and it's, it's important for us to be patient as we wait for the purposes that God has for us. And the last one is unchangeable promise. Unchangeable promise. And this brings us back to Hebrews chapter six. I'm gonna read it again. Hebrews chapter six says, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul. This passage is important to talk about when we talk about the immutability of God. It is the only passage that uses the word unchangeable. And unchangeable means not transposed, not transferred. It means unaltered. It means fixed. It's used, this word unchangeable is used when talking about the, the, an author of a will signing that will, that that will can, it's, it's unalterable, unchangeable, untransferable, except by the author of that will. Which, which should bring us some excitement when we think about what Hebrews 12, 2 says, that we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author of our faith. He's the author of our faith, but he is the only one that can change this in our life. These verses in, in Hebrews chapter six are in essence God's living will and testament. And, and we can bank on it that it is unchangeable and a promise for us not because it's just guaranteed by his word, but it is blood bought by the blood of Jesus. First Peter 1 says this, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. This is God's unchangeable promise to us, that we are justified by faith through the blood of Jesus. That's why according to Hebrews chapter six, it says that we can hold fast, that it is a 
sure and steadfast anchor for our soul. And I've got, I've got an anchor here, and uh, I'm going to try to not scratch up this stage. But I, I've had some experience with, with anchors, and, and unfortunately, I've had some negative experiences with anchors. Uh, the first negative experience was when I was told to throw the anchor and the rope wasn't attached. That one didn't go well. Never got it back. Sorry, Dad. Um, but there was a time when I, we have a little aluminum fishing boat, and uh, we were out on the Mississippi River, and our motor died. You're like, you should probably stop using boats, Davey. Uh, our motor died, and we were, we were at the mercy of the current of the Mississippi. So I, I, I said, we're going to throw the anchor over. I'm going to fix the motor, and then, and then we'll get back. And I, I threw the anchor over, and the anchor was small. <laughs> I found out later you're supposed to use a different kind of anchor when you're in a river. And we were at the mercy of the current, we were getting thrown all over the place, and it, it's a long story that I won't share now, but what matters is not the situation that you're in or the people that are in your boat. Is it, what matters is, is your anchor steadfast and sure? Is it fixed and immovable? And it's important that we acknowledge that the hope that we have is the anchor for our soul. It's not the things that we have that's the anchor for our soul. It's not the people in the boat that are the anchor for our, our soul, but it's the hope that we have because of the, the, the plans and purposes and promises of God in our life. And it's because of that, that sure and steadfast anchor that it says we can hold fast. We can hold strong. We can continue to believe, and we can hold fast for healing. Even though you feel like you're being tossed around and you're being moved around from diagnosis to different treatments to different doctors, you can still hold fast to the anchor of the plans and purposes and promises of God. You can hold fast for your family that even though it might feel like things are falling apart, Hold fast to the promises of God in your life and pray them over your family. And even though it might feel like things are going this way one day and this way another, you can only get as far away as you allow yourself to from your sure and steadfast anchor. You can hold fast to the promises for your marriage. You can hold fast for the healing in your body. You can hold fast for the things that seem impossible in your life. For that baby that you've been believing for, you can hold fast to the God of the impossible. The God that is unchangeable can do the impossible and the miraculous in your life. Great is thy faithfulness. He is faithful, unchanging, immovable. It's, he's, he's worthy of every ounce of our praise because he's steadfast, sure, and secure. The greatest change, talking about an unchangeable God, the greatest change that ever took place was not in a change of person or a change of purpose or a change of promise, but it was in a change of being. When the Word was made flesh and Jesus went from infinite to then finite and became a human. And on the cross, he went, he changed from life to death so that we could change from death to life. He then again changed from death to life and was ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father so that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we do believe that he will return and the dead will rise with him and we will be seated and, and worshiping for all eternity. That what we're walking through right now here on this earth is but a vapor. And as we hold fast, we're not just holding fast, hoping that the storm's gonna go away, but we know there's something better for us. We know that there's more for us. 
He's unmoved and unchanging, yet changes everything in our life. His grace is unchanging because it knows no limit. His faithfulness is unchanging because it has never failed. He changes the blind to sight. He changes the deaf to hearing. He changes the lame to walking, the sick to healing, the broken to wholeness, the tears to joy, the doubt to faith, the despair to hope, the weak to strength, the lost to found, and the dead to life. This is our unchangeable God.